we are having a session which is going to be um, a lecture given by a uh, Grass Jaco, and the lecture is on uh, just to read the abstract from um, from the website. In this um, uh, uh, lecture, Grace expands on the very important agent questions academics such as Achille Mbembe put forward when they ask what are the limits placed on the decolonization project by the forces of neoliberalism, and subsequently what happens to this project of decolonization when introduced in spaces that are still marked by colonial structures and by whiteness. And by engaging these uh, works of Ashil Mbembe and Sara Ahmed, she will explore not just how it is that whiteness does to colonized bodies, but how the coloniality of the treatment of these bodies is reproduced as whiteness engages with the work that is produced by colonized bodies. In other words, to uh, uh, see how whiteness responds to the presence of non-white bodies and the work that they perform in colonized spaces. And um, I'll briefly introduce um, our um, speaker, Grace. Uh, Grace Jaco obtained a BA in politics at the University of Amsterdam and an MA in philosophy from uh, Paris uh, Sabon, an MA philosophy plus in MS in political science from UVA. She wrote a master's thesis on African philosophy and about the conditions under which the authentic African thought can arise. She has worked as a teaching assistant in non-Western philosophy at UVA and organizes master classes on African philosophy in cooperation with uh, NINSA, that is the National Institute for the Study of Dutch Slavery and its Legacy. Currently, she is co-founding Black Renaissance, a foundation that aims to organize lectures, masterclass, and works on African and Afro-Caribbean philosophy. Um, I have the pleasure of um, inviting uh, Grace to share the thoughts that she has gathered on, on this, I think, very uh, uh, important topic that uh, I think it has not received enough attention, especially within you know uh, northern European spaces, and particularly in 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 Europe and in 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 the Lowlands, the Netherlands, and 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 Belgium, which have a very long and disturbing colonial history that is often not you know acknowledged. Grace, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, Larry, thank, uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for the lovely introduction. Um, I want to start out uh, my lecture first by reading the one of the poems that were part of uh, the short story I wrote, and that was uh, an assigned uh, an assigned reading for today. So the first one is. Uh, Ansu Stories by uh, Langston Hughes, um, which is a part of his uh, uh, collection of po poetry, uh, The Very Blues. And um, Langston Hughes was a very important African American poet, uh, and he was part of the Harlem Renaissance. So, Ansu Stories. Ansu has a head full of stories. Ansu has a whole heart full of stories. Summer night on the front porch, Ansu cuddles a brown-faced child to her bosom and tells him stories. Black slaves working in the hot sun and black slaves walking in the dewy night and black slaves singing sorrow songs on the banks of a mighty river mingle themselves softly in the flow of old Ansu's voice. Mingle themselves softly in the dark shadows that cross and we cross. Ansu's stories. And the dark-faced child listening knows that Ansu's stories are real stories. He knows that Ansu never got her stories out of any book at all, but that they came right out of her own life. And the dark-faced child is quiet of a summer night listening to Ansu's stories. Um, I, so I incorporated um, this um, poem by Langston Hughes 
uh, because I thought, first of all, because I, I, I love the poem and Langston Hughes is one of my favorite poets. And also because uh, for me, it showed the importance of stories and uh, the importance of stories to a community. So because uh, like the poem said, Ansu's stories are not just stories, they came out of her own life. And so uh, it talks about the cultural importance and relevance of stories um, and, and when they are, especially as they pass on to, um, to next generations, and uh, and are uh, important as a socializing factor to a community as well, and and then I I because it's uh, also brought me to reflect on what it then means when a story gets taken out of a certain context and then. Uh, and yeah, what what it means and what can happen, and and you see some of that in uh, the story I wrote, but it's also something that I'd like to expand uh, more on in today's lecture. So um, um, so yes, um, I teach non-Western philosophy at the University of Amsterdam, um, and. Uh, I also write a lot about uh, decoloniality and African philosophy. I wrote my thesis on African philosophy. And I first wanted to um, um, note uh, what we always do when we teach uh, non western philosophy at the University of Amsterdam is we always contextualize it first uh, as well. Uh, to uh, give an insight as to why other traditions have come to be become marginalized because um, this is not a given. Uh, like the, if the, the very reason why uh, we talk about non-Western philosophy and why it's only um, a small portion of uh, studies such as philosophy, um, that history is very recent uh, in the sense that uh, because that's also because uh, other traditions, African philosophy, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, are unfortunately not always seen as being uh, real philosophy. But even that a stigma, that the fact that Chinese philosophy is not real philosophy, is um, fairly, relatively uh, a new development uh, from the 19th century on. As before the 19th century, this was not necessarily the case. So therefore, a bit of historical context. Um, so philosophy was not as um, as a discipline was not institutionalized before the 19th century. Before the 19th century, uh, philosophy did not have its own academic chair. There was no strict division, division but because there was no strict division between philosophy and other disciplines. Um, many philosophers of the Western canon, such as René Descartes, David Hume, were not necessarily necessarily professional philosophers. Um, for example, and philosophers such as John Locke and René Descartes, for example, were primarily their function within the university was as mathematicians. That was their academic chair. And when it when philosophy gets its own academic chair, when it got its own academic chair, um, it started to sort of push back against other disciplines in order to distinguish itself, uh, distinguish itself as its own discipline. So the prevalent idea from then on is that philosophy is a strictly academic endeavor in which one needs to be schooled. It's a discipline that needs its own audience. And it's also during this time that Western philosophy starts to become more skeptical of other traditions, of other intellectual traditions. They are now con not considered to be philosophy. They came to be seen as wisdom teachings that needs to be studied by a philologist, someone who studies languages, not by a philosopher. And of course, if we look at the broader global historical context, 
the 19th century will also be marked by colonial expansion. So Western philosophers from the 19th century on become dismissive of philosoph philosoph uh, philosophical traditions from other regions of the world and don't consider them to be philosophy, a notion that unfortunately uh, in many countries uh, goes on till this very day. So things are slow, changing slowly, but the idea that philosophy is Western is still very much prevalent um, it's something that I also experienced uh, during uh, as a student, as I, as a master student, as I was writing my thesis on African philosophy. Unfortunately for me, um, uh, uh, the professor I was working with, who was guiding me along with um, uh, with my thesis, was uh, himself also specialized in uh, non-Western tradition. In his case, he was specialized in Islamic philosophy. And he um, also uh, he wor he has worked at the UVA University of Amsterdam for many years, and has also all often experienced this pushback against his work of people not valuing Islamic philosophy as being a uh, as being philosophy. Um, uh, but unfortunately, fortunately, there was someone like like him at the University of Amsterdam, and it was then open for me to research. Uh, African philosophy, while there are many other um, professors at the University of Amsterdam um, who are very much of the old guard stating yeah, that philosophy needs to be Western, especially like the more Kantian and Hegelian um, professors at the university, at the university from, especially from these type of professors, I experienced this kind of pushback. Um, um, so, um, but so we can talk about what we then see is um, what we call Eurocentrism, um, as the Europe, European, Western is seen as the norm, as any other other traditions are seen as a wisdom, not really being philosophy, and even saying that. Uh, that exp philosophy is explicit, explicitly saying that philosophy is Western, is European, and that even uh, there being is an Islamic philosophy, African philosophy, Chinese philosophy, uh, mean uh, this idea that this already means a failure of philosophy, since especially, um, especially from those professors who are in a very Hegelian mindset, as you know. And in search for the truth, and for them, uh, for, uh, for them, stating that talking about Islamic philosophy, African philosophy, Chinese philosophy would mean uh, a failure of philosophy because it would mean that uh, there is an African truth, a Chinese truth, an Islamic truth. Well, um, and this idea was that this was going against the very notion of philosophy, since philosophy is a search for the truth and truth can only be one so um and this one then is western is european so in that sense we can you can see uh, what yeah, what's called a eurocentrism in the mindset but this eurocentrism was exemplified by many of the so-called great european philosophers um as Kant, Immanuel kant once wrote the Negroes of Africa have by nature no feeling that rises above, above the trifling. Mr. Hume challenges anyone to cite a single example in which a Negro has shown talents and asserts that among the hundreds of thousands of blacks who were transported elsewhere from their countries, although many of them have even been set free, still not a single one was ever found um, who presented anything great in art or science or any other praiseworthy quality even though among the whites some continually rise uh, aloft from the lowest rabble and through superior gifts in earn respect in the world. So fundamental is the difference between those these two races of men, and it appears to be as great in regard to mental capacities as in color. As according to Kant, who is of course in European philosophy, uh, Western philosophy, um, regarded to be a universalist thinker, a humanist philosopher. Um, 
And so we can see that according to philosophers such as Kant and Hume, Africans don't have mental compa compa capacities and that is not capable of philosophical thought. And another noteworthy example is Hegel. Hegel calls Africa the land of childhood. As he says, the land of childhood, which lying beyond the day of self-conscious history, is enveloped in the dark mantle of night. In Negro life, the characteristic point is the fact that consciousness has not yet attained to the realization of any subst substantial objective existence. The African is natural man in his completely wild and untamed, um, untamed state. So this means that Africa is ahistorical, outside of history, and doesn't have morality, religion, or political institutions. Um, and this Eurocentrism then consists of a refusal to attribute a developed consciousness to the other, in this case, Africans. It sees itself as the norm. Africa, the child, cannot exist or survive without Europe, the adult. And it is up to the, the adult to teach the child. Its progress will be judged by the adult. His likeness to him will serve as a measure. Um, the philosopher Chilisa typifies this as a violent way of dismissing the indigenous people's knowledge as irrelevant and a way of disconnecting them uh, from, what they, from what they knew and how they knew it. Uh, Chilis, um, but of course, in the case of these European philosophers, their own thinking is not pure reason. It is historically and culturally dependent. And just as... Um, 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 to give you uh, an example of a uh, type of mindset and to show that it is something that uh, we have unfortunately not surpassed, uh, I will sh just share in the chat an um, infamous um, speech that former French president Nicolas Sarkozy once held in, um, in uh, Dakar. Uh, which in the French speaking world and in many African uh, kind, yeah, for many Africans has become an infamous speech, uh, simply known as Le Discours de Dakar. If you say to any French speaking African, uh, uh, talk, if you talk about them, about Le Discours uh, de, uh, de Dakar, they'll probably know uh, what you're referring to. One moment, I'll just share the, the link in the chat. Thanks. Okay. Um, and so I'll just share it in the chat so that you can watch it in your own time uh, if you're interested. Uh, because um, if you look at um, the th uh, what he says, you'll see that you see a lot of the same Hegelian themes uh, back in the speech. Um, because he explicitly how explicitly states that um, Africans have not entered history yet, and um, so it was um, kind of shocking to, for him to say that uh, in Dakar, a former French colony. But also, he was um, he did he gave the speech at the Sheikh Ante Diop University of Dakar, and Sheikh Ante Diop was um, important. Um, African historian who um, who did a lot of research about pre-colonial Africa and uh, Afri and about African civil did a lot of historical research on African civilizations for so then uh, for an institution that was named after this African historian to then have the president of a former um, to have the president of the former uh, uh, colonizer. Um, then say, oh yeah, uh, Africans have not entered history yet, is of course um, very painful. Let's see if I can share the link. Wait. Yeah. Uh, 
Yes, if I can help you. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so yeah, the link is in the chat right now. So if you're interested, you can uh, just um, uh, look at it in your spare time and then analyze it, uh, and then analyze it by uh, comparing it to um, to uh, the Hegelian discourse. So what Hegel says in uh, the uh, uh, philosophy of history, and then you'll see, you'll notice that. It's pretty much the same type of discourse, which meaning that we've not surpassed this idea of yeah Africans being uh, ahistorical. So as these ideas were very much prevalent, not only so uh, not only back in the 19th century as we see it still to this day, but Sarkozy uh, uh, is, uh, is a contemporary person still making this type of discourse. Um, it was uh, very much something that uh, typified um, a colonial, uh, colonialism, um, especially um, the, as the, uh, Heg uh, this Hegelian ideas were very much uh, became what was later what later became uh, la mission civilisatrice, this uh, civilizing mission, and so the first response by many black thinkers and writers and black writers uh, when confronted with these hegelian ideas with these eurocentric ideas is to uh, set out to prove that there is indeed such a thing as african philosophy and to this idea to bring about decolonization through intellectual engagement and uh, so that was uh, one of the first uh, uh, type of uh, decolon uh, decolonial resistance that we saw for coming from um, black writers and thinkers. Um, so one notable ex uh, example was the Negritude mo movement in uh, the uh, French-speaking colonies and also uh, the Harlem Renaissance um, in the United States. Uh, which Langston Hughes was a part of, and the Harlem Renaissance influenced the Negritude movement in the in the French-speaking um, African and Caribbean countries. Um, because um, so the, Neg the Negritude movement were very critical of this type of approach of this idea uh, that. Uh, uh, there, that there was no such that there is no African civilization that African cultures are uh, subpar or not that are uh, not a, and uh, out that Africans are outside of history um, by trying to reclaim this uh, by trying to reclaim um, African culture reclaim a sense of uh, pride in African um, African culture and history. So uh, I want to uh, read out a very famous um, passage from uh, a poem by um, Aimé Césaire, because his uh, book, Cahier d'un retour au pays natal, um, was came to be the one of the greater works of the Negritude, and it's, the, and it's in this book that uh, term negritude was coined. So in his poem, in, in, a, in a part of the book, he says, Des mots, ah oui, des mots. Raison, je te sacre vent du soir. Bouche de l'or ton nom, il me corolle du fouet. Beauté, je t'appelle, pétition de la pierre. Mais ah, la roc contrebande de mon rire. Ah, mon trésor de salpêtre, parce que nous vous haïtions, vous et votre raison. Nous nous réclamons de la démence précoce de la folie flambante, du can cannibalisme tenace, trésor content, la, fo la folie qui souvient, la folie qui hurle, la folie qui voit, la folie qui se déchaîne, et vous savez le reste. Que, que deux et deux font cinq, que la fo forêt miaule, que l'arbre tire les marrons du feu, que le ciel, lisse, que le ciel se lisse la barbe, etc., etc. So the segment is from Cahier d'un retour au pays natal by Aimé Césaire, and it's considered to be the seminal work in Negritude. As I said, it was here that the word Negritude is mentioned for the first time. And it is part of the poem, 
Aimé Césaire rejects reason. And by reason, he particularly means French reason, Cartesian reason. So as he says, um, raison, uh, je te sacrifie du soir, which means reason, I will sacrifice you to the evening wind. And so, that, so this reason is French reason, Cartesian reason, is to him an oppressive reason, a reason that signifies a constant separation from between object and subject, body and mind. Um, he embraces madness, the madness that remembers, the madness that shouts, the madness that sees, the madness that frees itself, and thus he proclaims that two and two equals five. So Negritude was very critical of Cartesian reason, of Cartesian dualism. Leopold Senghor, another uh, fam um, for famous writer and poet from the Negritude movement, who later became the president of Senegal, argued that the European holds the object from a distance, looks at it, analyzes it, and kills it in order to use it. While African reason uh, feels the object and assimilate itself with the object in order to know it profoundly. In Western Cartesian reason, which he also calls eu raison, so I reason, I is, yeah, I of sight, I reason, is discursive and preoccupies itself with the appearance of the object. African reason goes beyond the visible to reach the reality of the object. And so Negritude was a social, not only a um, literary movement, but also a social and cultural movement that arose amongst black writers and poets from the French colonies in the Caribbean and continental Africa. And as such, it was a response to the French colonial enterprise and its policy of assimilation. The advent of the European in Africa was to them a shattering experience as colonial rule meant a drastic reordering of African communities and uh, cultures and reordering of human relations. So it's a political and social reorganization of African communities. Um, Irene notes that a colonial rule substitu substituted new poles of reference for social organization and individual life, which were often in conflict with established traditional pattern and thus created a society which appeared to possess an essentially non-authentic character. So this was the historical context in which the writers and poets of Negritude lived and to which they reacted. So it was a refusal and denial of an imposed world order and a wish for, cultural, for a cultural differentiation. As Emmer said, we lived in an atmosphere of rejection and we developed an inferiority complex. I have always thought that the black man was searching for his identity. And it has seemed to me that if we want um, that what we want is to establish this identity, then we must have a concrete consciousness of what we are, that is, of the first fact of our lives, that we are black, that we were black and have a history, a history that contains certain cultural elements of great value. So the next poem uh, by, um, that I will read is by Leon Dama. Uh, this poem is about the rejection of assimilation. It's called Sol. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule dans leurs souliers, dans leur smoking, dans leurs plastrons, dans leurs faux cols, dans leurs monocles, dans leurs melons. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule dans leurs salons, dans leurs manières, dans leurs courbettes, dans leurs formules, dans leurs multiples besoins de messagerie. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule avec tout ce qu'ils racontent jusqu'à ce qu'ils vous servent l'après-midi, un peu d'eau chaude et des gâteaux enrhumés. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule avec les théories qu'ils assaisonnent au bout de leurs besoins, de leur passion, de leur instinct ouvert la nuit en forme de paillaison. J'ai l'impression d'être ridicule parmi eux complices, parmi eux, parmi eux souteneurs, parmi eux égorgeurs, les mains effroyablement rouges du sang de leur civilisation. So, uh, Léon Dama rejects French attire in the poem. And he says, uh, yeah, j'ai l'impression d'être ridicule dans, dans leur soubier, dans leur smoking. So I have the uh, impression of being, um, so he feels ridiculous in their shoes, French shoes and French, French smoking, uh, smoking, so French, yeah, suit and tie. 
um, French, he rejects uh, French attire, French customs and culture as he feels ridiculous wearing um, the French attire and expressing himself in their manner, um, yeah, dans leur salon, dans leur manière. And it was also about, um, Nick Levy was also about solidarity amongst Black people all over the world. It's about the history of a community, their history of deportations from one continent to another, their memories of beliefs that came from afar, and the remains of their assassinated cultures. So there was a belief in the value of the collective memory of Black peoples and even a collective unconsciousness. Amy Césaire said to not believe in this notion that one arrives in the world with an empty mind, just as we don't arrive with empty hands. There were living values and lived experiences amongst Black peoples. So real stories, just like Ansu in the poem by Langton Hughes. So negritude is also memory, fidelity and solidarity. So the writers and poets of negritude were themselves, uh, as I said previously, heavily influenced by Black American writers uh, that made up the um, heart of Renaissance, such as uh, Langston Hughes, of whom I read the poem, uh, but also Anne Locke and uh, Claude McKay. Senghor even went as far as saying that it was W.E.B. Du Bois who, through his book, The Source of Black Folk, um, published in 1903, was the true founder of Negritude. And about the solidarity amongst Black people, uh, Césaire said, I understood that I could not be indifferent to what was happening in Haiti or Africa, as he himself was from, from uh, Martinique. It's a small Caribbean, um, um, uh, small island in the Caribbean, just still uh, to this day a uh, French colony. And then in a way, we slowly came to the idea of a sort of black civilization spread throughout the world. And I've come to the realization that there was a Negro situation that existed in different geographical areas, that Africa was also my country. There was the African continent, the Antilles, Haiti. There were Martinicans and Brazilian Negroes, etc. That's what Negritude meant to me. And then the last poem that I want to read is by Jean Fernand Prière, and it's called Me revoici Harlem. Me revoici Harlem. Frère noir, me voici no, ni moins pauvre que toi, ni moins triste ou plus grand. Je suis parmi la foule, à l'anonyme passant qui grossit le convoi, la goutte noire solidaire de tes houles. Nous connûmes tous deux l'horreur des négriers, et souvent, comme toi, tu sens des courbatures. Se réveiller après le siècle le meurtrier et saigner dans ta chair les anciennes blessures. Nous avons désappris le dialecte africain. Tu chantes en, tu chantes en anglais mon rêve et ma souffrance. Au, au rythme de tes blouses, danse mes vieux chagrins. Et je dis ton angoisse en la langue de France. Quand tu saignes, Harlem, sans poupre mon mouchoir. Quand tu souffres, ta, pla ta plainte en mon chant se prolonge de la même ferveur et dans le même soir. Frère noir, nous, font, nous faisons tous deux le même songe. So in this poem, he talks about this shared experience, this shared black experience, uh, that he highlights that there is not, it's not the, uh, that the difference between a black person living in Harlem, New York, and a black person like him from the French Caribbean. Um, yeah from um he was as he was from uh, haiti so as he says both of them have experienced um this have experienced this uh the trauma of slavery experienced this trauma of losing one's african culture african languages and as um as the black american uh, sings of his sorrows in english on the rhythm of the blues He's, he sings them in French. So. so then this is what we see as the first type of responses to this, uh, to colonialism uh, that we see from the negritude and the Harlem Renaissance as a kind of defense of uh, one's own culture, one's own civilization, and trying to prove that one does have um, uh, a, 
a civilization that one does have a uh, culture that one does have uh, that one that one is capable of um, of intellectual thought but then subsequent thinkers and writers were very critical of this type of approach such as Frantz Fanon um, who's an, also a thinker um, philosopher and psycho a psychiatrist from Martinique as well. He had been a student of Aimé Césaire um, and have, has even worked for Aimé Césaire as uh, when um, uh, Aimé Césaire um, ran a political campaign in Martinique. Um, and he was an admirer of Aimé Césaire as, uh, as, uh, because in contrast to other Martinican uh, intellectuals of the time who very much bought into this idea of assimilation, assimilation into uh, French culture and to the French idea of what civilization is. Aimé Césaire was very critical of it and uh, was, uh, yeah, was very uh, critical uh, of um, uh, this, uh, the whole uh, colonial enterprise. Uh, but Frantz Fanon pointed out how this type of approach is incomplete. So one cannot decolonize simply by, by proving that there is such a thing as uh, African philosophy, that, that one does possess a, a certain a level uh, of civilization. Um, or to prove to the colonizer that one's culture is civilized or that one is uh, as sophisticated as Western culture. As he says in um, Le Dame de la Terre, uh, the, in the English translation is The Wretch of the Earth. L'intellectuel colonisé, cependant, tôt ou tard, se rendra compte qu'on ne prouve pas sa nation à partir de la culture, mais qu'on la manifeste dans le combat que mène le peuple contre les forces d'occupation. So, um, the, the colonized intellectual has to, sooner or later, realize that uh, one does not prove or defend one's own uh, nation uh, by uh, on the basis of culture, but one manifests it in, in the struggle, in the fight that the, the, that the people, so like the, his, uh, uh, his fellow people, um, uh, are fighting against occupying forces. And then he also says, On ne fera jamais honte au colonialisme en déployant, en déployant devant son regard des trésors culturels méconnus, méconnus. So you're not going to shame the col colonialism uh, by simply showing cultural treasures by simply showing that, oh, look, this is what we have. We are as cultural, cultured or civilized as you are. Look here, look here are our artists just as worthy of, Fre of French artists. Or uh, look at the works of literature we produce, which are uh, worthy of, um, of uh, any French writer. Um, he thought he, he thought that as uh, um, he thought of it as a uh, um, as a as a project that is doomed because even for example uh, in Peau Noir Masque Blanc uh, uh, Black Skin White Mask which was his uh, first the um, his first book that was published. He talks, um, there is a passage in which he talks about the way Aimé Césaire's book, uh, 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 um, uh, Retour au Pays Natal, was received by uh, French intellectuals. And this not, uh, and, and not just uh, uh, centrist or right-wing intellectuals, but even uh, leftist intellectuals who were sympathetic to the plight of black, um, uh, of black people. So he talks about um, André Breton, uh, André Breton, of course, a famous um, a poet of the uh, uh, part of the surrealist movement. Uh, 
the way he talked about Aimé Césaire's work and how he was, André Breton, seemingly complimenting uh, Aimé Césaire uh, by saying, oh, look, uh, uh, look how th this uh, a black writer, black poet, uh, masters the French language just as well as any French, um, French writer, which is, of course, very patronizing. Um, as saying, oh, because he's essentially as if he's surprised that Aimé Césaire is well versed in the French language, while Aimé Césaire, being from Martinique, has been schooled from young, uh, from a very young age in the French language. He went to, um, uh, he went uh, and he, uh, he he studied in Paris at. Um, uh, at all, at uh, the same institutions where very famous French writers and French philosophers uh, studied. Um, so uh, Frans Fanon asked the question, but why is André Breton so surprised uh, that André uh, that Aimé Césaire would master the uh, the French uh, language as well as he does? Um, so why is he still in a, a put in a, in a position where he has to prove himself to be as uh, as smart, as um, as eloquent as uh, as any uh, as a French writer, a French philosopher would. So then, so then this is why he Fanon. Uh, it is a, one of the examples why Fanon has no. Um, um, uh, faith in this type of enterprise. And after all, when all is said and done, when one has managed to showcase these cultural works, when one shows the self um, through uh, one's art, who is to say how the other, other will take this in? So what's to prevent for, uh, for this to become another object to observe? So, because unfortunately this has, um, this has happened with Negritude, much of the so um, Negritude was not just a literary movement; it was also very political uh, because of it, uh, of it being about uh, a criticism of French colonialism. Uh, this being about reclaiming the one's uh, uh, reclaiming uh, one's own African identity. But much of the political aspect of it has been stripped down subsequently uh, in, uh, in, within the French context. Um, so it, for it to be just, uh, it became just a piece of, uh, as it entered the uh, French intellectual circles, um, became just a piece of black artifact, artifact that can be studied. So the political goal, that in the sense that it was explicitly against French universalism, explicitly against a French assimilation, French colonialism has been diminished. And in the sense that uh, today, for example, you see in the French context, um, there is a very severe critique against what they see as American race, uh, critical race theory, Gras, Ameri uh, American Gras, identity politics. Yeah, uh, you you have uh, not more than five minutes before. Uh, yeah, I, I, I can't hear you. You 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 have not more than five minutes before the lecture ends. Is it just me or you you can hear me? Can you maybe uh, put your comments in the chat? Yeah, you have five minutes. Uh, somebody, Martha says she can hear me. Okay, yeah, you have so five so minutes, so five so minutes, so. five minutes. Or maybe um, I will try to. Um... Oh, okay, I have five more minutes. I. Um, so yeah. Um... So yeah, this, so this, has, this is what ha has happened with Negritude. So much of the political aspects have been, um, have been, have been stripped down. Um, and so the, the problem is, 
uh, that uh, they um, uh, uh, so, so the so, so the problem is that this, as uh, the as the political aspect of it has been swept down, it's now just seen as oh, like look at this uh, black uh, cultural object that that can be studied. Um, it's real. It's it's surprising to see uh, that fr the, uh, these same French people can now be so critical of what they call American uh, critical race theory, American identity politics, um, and criticizing this for being against French uh, against um, any type of universalism, when the thing that they study. So that would be so, uh, something like the Negritude, like the works of Emile Césaire, which is incorporated most uh, a, a lot in um, uh, French academic circles. Not seeing that what what they criticize uh, contemporary um, a critical race theory for doing, being against universalism, was already what the Negritude was already doing in, at the, in the early. 20th century, and what could easily make an argument for saying that maybe the, in some aspects the negritude even went further than contemporary uh, uh, critical race uh, theorists uh, uh, would do. So, um, and this, this, um, so this is also why I incorporated the paper by Tuk and Yang. Uh, decolonization is not a metaphor, as they say. When metaphor invades decolonization. It kills the very possibility of decolonization. It recenters whiteness. It resettles theory. It extends innocence to the settler. It attains a settler future. So it begs the question: What happens to this project of decolonization when introduced in spaces that are still marked by colonial structures? What it ultimately comes down to is how we think about knowledge, and what it means to have expertise. What is the expert? So decolonizing the curriculum or decolonize, decolonizing the university cannot simply be about bringing more diversity um, of bringing uh, in the course material or subject matter. So it's not just about, oh, are we going to uh, bring something like negritude in um, white academic space, spaces. It is not simply about bringing blackness in the academy as a center of knowledge. Um, as more attention is being paid to other parts of the world, um, it is uh, important to proceed with caution and reflect on this newfound interest as well, because there is essentially nothing new about having an interest in the other, because that is what has already uh, been going on since colonialism. One can even say that uh, colonialism was very much uh, uh, typified also by this supposed interest in the other um, people. You might have heard of uh, stories uh, such as, well, human zoos, but also a story like uh, Saatje Bartman, who was brought from South Africa to Europe in order to be studied. So there is always a danger of bringing uh, not just a uh, Black people, but um, a black, uh, a black uh, intellectual uh, work in a space that is still very much um, uh, still very, uh, still very much um, structured around the same um, co uh, colonial structures, same uh, um, presupposition that uh, this place is the center of all knowledge. This place being the academy, the European Western University. Oh, okay. Uh, one way to complete. Um, so yes. Um, then I'll see. Um, so then, just by uh, um, uh, by uh, uh, finished by uh, going back to uh, Ashim Bembe, also someone who. Uh, I assigned uh, for, to, uh, for today. Um, as he writes that um, he, he criticizes a Eurocentric view as he discusses the work of Ngugu Wa Tsiongo, 
and he for him is a matter matter of recentering, uh, which means rejecting the assumption that the modern West is a central root of Africa's consciousness and cultural heritage. And it pertains to a larger issue um, that the university as a colonial westernized westernized institution. So um, he talks about academic institution as being westernized and they, as he says, they are westernized in the sense that they are local instantations of a dominant academic model based on a Eurocentric epistemic canon. A Eurocentric canon is a canon um, yeah, that attributes truth only to the Western way of knowledge production. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much for this uh, thought-provoking um, uh, lecture that you've given, going to tap into you know the history of um, uh, Europe and the question of philosophy, in particular in relation to the question of um, African philosophy. And yeah, um, uh, I remember when I went to university in South Africa, and when I had the course on African philosophy, and the first question that was addressed in my course on African philosophy was the question, does African philosophy exist? Yes, yes, that's also and, the first question. Yeah, and this question presupposes uh, the question of Africans' capacity to do philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but before we dive into uh, um, uh, the discussion on this lecture, I think we may we may um, uh, try to answer some of the questions that were raised by participants in the in the uh, uh, document. And. Uh, I'm wondering if we should begin with some questions directly in relation to this lecture or some questions that we have, you know, uh, we have received uh, this morning with regards to the readings that uh, uh, were prescribed for, for this lecture. Um, since we don't have questions arising from the lecture now, I think I'll I'll throw a few questions to you in relation to the text that we were asked to, to, to read in preparation for, for this lecture. And then later on, we'll come back to some of the very important questions that you've raised in, in your lecture. And um, I think the first question that uh, was raised uh, was concerning the question of um, uh, uh, Sarah Ahmed's notion of, you know, phenomenology of whiteness. And the question, you know, uh, uh, wants to know if this experience of discomfort is it specifically related to uh, the experience of whiteness or it has other categories of uh, exclusions that may you know may uh, 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 may be related to this uh, experience of uh, um, discomfort or un uh, uncomfortability so it's easy, so it's difficult to just take one thing right so that's why today nowadays we do talk about intersectionality because um uh various categories uh do intersect with each other uh but it's also important to note because there while there has been a lot of discussion in academic circles about this notion of gender and uh you know the uh the so and the position of uh, female uh, uh, academics within uh, academic circle, but it mostly has focused on white women. That the very central place that race also plays uh, in this, as uh, um, um, so, so because of um, so, so the, uh, like. Uh, um, maybe also talks about this very Eurocentric uh, uh, notion of um, of knowledge, of uh, knowledge not knowledge production, and uh, that uh, br brings about uh, uh, great discomfort whenever uh, whenever you try to decenter um, white subjectivity. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I I hope that was a very a clear answer to that question. And also, I mean, even within the text, 
if my memory serves me very well, Ahmed addresses the question of intersectionality to say these categories, you know, they are always, you know, uh, uh, intersected, they cross each other. You yeah. live in the world, not only as a racialized subject, but as a male or female yeah. racialized subject. And yeah. class also plays a very fundamental role. So, yeah, thank you. And then there's another question that uh, um, uh, was raised with regards to um, uh, the two papers, one by Ashil Mbembe and the other one by uh, uh, Yang. And uh, uh, okay. the reader was wondering if there is a form of contradiction in terms of how Ashil Mbembe defines decolonization and how Yang also, you know, defines uh, uh, decolonization. They get a sense that there is a form of, you know, divergence in terms of how they, you know, expect the concept of decolonization and the process of decolonization to take place. So do you have any uh, uh, comments on, on that? Yeah, because uh, essentially, uh, because Tuk and Yang are very much more they come also from a different uh, context as um, as they look at the way uh, specifically Native American uh, uh, indigenous uh, uh, identity uh, and uh, uh, theory surrounding decolonization, what it means. Because for, for, for first of all, what decolonization means for indigenous people in the Americas is of course also already different to what it means uh, to uh, black people, African peoples as uh, as Native Americans, of course, indigenous peoples in people in the Americas, they more even more specifically than many other than other um, colonized uh, subjects such as African peoples but uh, in uh, come from a context where there is uh, a set uh, very much a settler colonial uh, settler colonial context where they have the indigenous peoples have now become the minority well uh, whereas uh, african uh, most african countries uh, uh, even those that are that have experienced settler colonialism, such as Zimbabwe or South Africa, do uh, they have at least not become the minority in their very own country? So then, what you're up against when you're when you're faced with a political situation where your land has been stolen and um, uh, where, where not only your land has been stolen, you're colonized because you're uh, where you've been colonized and your land has been stolen, but you're also now uh, not seen as a, an owner of the land anymore. And uh, the way even indigenous identity has been constructed in the uh, the Americas is uh, therefore is very different as as to the the way uh, black identity has been uh, racialized. So that also already uh, explains some uh, of the difference between what then, uh, uh, what decolonization will come to uh, to mean to you. So, um, so yeah, so I was saying that uh, there is a difference. Uh, there's already a difference in, our, in the political situation between indigenous peoples in the Americas and uh, African. Uh, and African peoples who have been colonized. So that also already explains a part of uh, the reason why one would uh, form a different uh, decolonial project, because as colonialism, as there are many uh, uh, commonalities between various forms of colonialism, there are also differences in in these cases between whether uh, 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 African people who have been colonized and indigenous peoples, if the Americas who have been colonized, who've not only dealt with colonial colonialism, but sp more specifically settler colonialism and a settler colonialism, which led to them eventually becoming a, a, a minority. So 
this explains uh, this already explains um, uh, a, a, a a difference in uh, a polit uh, of the difference in the political awareness uh, that would that would that would then occur and in in the in the way in which one then needs to politically organize oneself you know yeah no yeah thank you very much for that question um, i mean for that response precisely because i mean uh, colonialism was you know global in so many ways because yeah. by yeah uh, i think the mid uh, uh, 20th uh, century i think more than 86% of the world was you know colonized by european powers and they had different technologies through which, you know, different spaces, you know, uh, were colonized. And in the case of the Americas, because already by the 16th century, there was settler colonialism, which, you know, took a, a different trajectory, a different history compared to Africa or Asia. So mm -hmm. each space demands a specific, you know, process of decolonization that, yeah. yeah. But also not just the not just the, the colonialist. There was not just a uh, difference in uh, the forms of colonialism, but also the racialization, which was different uh, when it comes to black people and uh, indigenous peoples. Like even within the United States, like because there are black Americans and there are Native Americans, but they were not racialized the same way. And the the identities uh, surrounding blackness and indigeneity were not constructed in the same manner. For example, just for uh, just an example, uh, black people in the United States uh, were confronted with what is called the one drop rule. Why? Because the, it was in, in the interest of white Americans, in the interest of colonizers, to have as much black people as possible, because this would mean uh, a greater number of enslaved people that could be in, ex, um, exploited on the plantations. Whereas uh, indigenous people, uh, indi indigenous identity was constructed in the way that they wanted uh, as few people possible to be able to claim indigenity because less, the, the fewer indigenous people there are, that means of, there are fewer people who can have a claim to land. So that also, like, the, it's not just colonialism that was different when it comes to Africans and indigenous Amer indigenous peoples in the America, in the mm -hmm. Americas, but also the way in which these uh, people were racialized is also different. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much for uh, that response. Uh, there's there's another question that uh, we received this morning from uh, the participants who. Um, uh, are wondering to what extent can we make Mbembe's ideas that he pushes forwards to in you know uh, towards the end of his article uh, uh, with regards to you know decolonizing the university space uh, they find it a bit um, uh, too theoretical and too abstract uh, and they are wondering what should we uh, begin with should we uh, start thinking about decolonization, you know, theoretically, abstractly, or rather should we start first by trying to, you know, uh, concretely institute, you know, uh, um, institutions that will enable the process of uh, decolonization. So should we begin from the theoretical or should we rather, you know, start with real actual change, if that's a word to use? Because if, the problem is, if you just start by uh, theor the theoretical approach, who's going to do the theorizing? You know? Because if it's just uh, people of European descent uh, thinking amongst themselves how a European can be, how the university can become decolonized, or how uh, uh, Yes, yeah, so how the university can become decolonized, then what is the guarantee that um, similar structures or that uh, other forms of coloniality will seep in once again? I think we lost him again. Or Yes, I think so too. Um, but maybe I can take this opportunity to uh, asking some questions from the chat directly. 
um, until Josias is, is with us yeah. again. <laughs> I am sorry for the interruption, you were on a nice uh, streak together. Um, but this might be good because our participants had some, had some questions uh, for you based on the talk. And there was one in particular that asked you um, whether you could address a little bit more the idea of humans as objects among the various types of objects. Uh, and this is to be found in Bembe's text, apparently. Um, and she or he would like to know um, if you can elaborate a bit more on, on this idea. Yeah, because um, that is an idea that can be found in uh, in the work of Frans van Oh, sorry. Um, in the meantime, we uh, we we'll get, we'll get back to your question later on. We're just uh, um, I'm just answering this uh, question by uh, 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 by the moderator by the moderator. Um, it's uh, it's this idea that uh, uh, that uh, that is found in. Uh, Peau Noir, Mask Blanc by Frans van Hall, Black Skin, White Mask. So he, uh, and he talks about the white gaze, um, how it, uh, the white gaze creates the other in, uh, and through which um, Africans have become another. And uh, van Hall describes this beautifully in chapter five of Peau Noir, Mask Blanc. Uh, called uh, l'expérience vécu du noir, um, uh, which sometimes trans translated into English as the fact of black blackness or um, uh, the lived experience of the of the of the black. Um, this so because uh, the white is seen as neutral or as uh, uh, not just as neutral but as uh, the subject and black people only uh, are 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 just those bodies that are perceived by uh, by by the white by the white gaze and this is also how the uh, word negre came to be uh, um, um, so uh, sometimes falsely translated as the n word in, uh, in Dutch, uh, but what Van Noon is trying to highlight uh, with this is how um, just even by the fact that there is a separate word for that was invented for uh, for black people is to denounce how is, is to denote how blackness is separate from humanity. Um, so uh, as he, as he states, uh, I'm going to they see if I have the. Oh, I can just take the passage. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I, wait wait a minute. Yes, there is um. There's a passage in which he um he in which he know, knows it, it says um. But with me, things take on a new face. I'm not given a second chance. I am overdetermined from the outside, so from a gaze that comes from uh, from from the gaze from an external external party. I am a slave not to the idea others have of me, but to my appearance. So the way the black body appears to the white gaze, and um, he then later on also says. Uh, wait I arrive slowly in the world, S so sudden emergence are no longer my habit. I crawl along. The white gaze, the only valid one, is already dissecting me. I am fixed. I'm fixed. Once their microtomes are sharpened, the whites objectively cut sections of my reality. I have been betrayed. I sense I see in this white gaze that, that it's the arrival, not of a new man, but of a new type of man, a new species, a Negro, in fact. So then this is uh, what it, uh, what it, uh, uh, what it, uh, then the gaze does, it creates the other, 
it makes uh, black people into something other than human because they are they uh, uh, they are part of a new category because the word negre does not uh, does not describe um, uh, uh, a characteristic that a person may have. It's not um, uh, it's not what you say. Um, uh, it's its own noun. It's it's not just it's it's it, it, it's its own. Uh, the word negre is its own noun. So that's why he says it's not a new man. It's it's a new species, something other than human, and and then it's, it's something other than human, a new a new species, uh, simply the negre. So and uh, which only exists because of the white gaze. So, and it's very important to see how in Bonoir Masque Blanc, uh, Fanon uses uh, the word negre and noir. It, uh, uh, he uses both terms, but they mean, they have different, he ascribes different meanings to them. So noir, black, is the black person as a person, as you will. But negre is the black, uh, is, uh, is uh, the black in the eyes of the white in the eyes in, created by the white gaze and as a, col a colonized subject and therefore also as an object to the gaze of the white. And Bim is very much influenced by the work of Fanon. And this is what you see to, uh, in the work of Fanon, but also uh, I've, wrote, I've written an essay uh, about, uh, the, about Fanon and uh, Ponoir Masplan, because you also see how someone like Patrice Lumumba also plays with both uh, with the word noir and negre in this way, uh, noir when it when he talks about the Congolese people as people, but when he talks about uh, co the Congolese people as subjected to uh, uh, colonialism, when subjected to the humil humiliation of colonialism, as uh, then he invokes the word negre. So, so um, um, when uh, Talk, uh, talking about uh, uh, the uh, of uh, the black as the object, it is very much to because of the way uh, uh, the white case creates um, uh, creates the black. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, uh, that point, and I think that point ties in very well to what uh, Sarah Ahmed tries to do with the question of whiteness, because. I mean, human subjectivity to a certain extent is denied of the colonized subject or post-colonized subject within white spaces, within white institutions, within white universities. The capacity for the colonized subjects to, you know, express their subjectivity as human subjects is so much limited. You know, I think it's uh, Louis Gordon who talks of race, you know, you know, imposes ontological con a constriction on racialized subjects. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so with 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 Fanon and uh, with the point that you, you you are raising now, and also in relation to to the text that uh, uh, people read, you actually make a very um, uh, good uh, point. Hence, the the relationship between the subject and uh, the object that the question in the chat was trying to uh, 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 raise. And I also like this other quote of Fanon, which is also in chapter five of Bonnoir Masculin, in which he, yeah, he explicitly talks about how he becomes the object in front, uh, in, uh, in the eyes of a white subject. He says, uh, dirty nigger, or simply, look, a, neg a negro. I came into this world anxious to uncover the meaning of things. My soul desirous, desirous to be at the origin of the world, and here I am, an object among other objects. Precisely, precisely. And that's what uh, uh, whiteness does to, you know, to the people it constitutes as its other. And whiteness not only in terms of uh, spaces, but also in terms of the literature that we read, in terms of how we, uh, we do philosophy, who we philosophize with, and also in terms of how the university uh, uh, is run. Um, um, yeah, but we, uh, so before you, 
uh, we lost the connection. We were to, uh, you asked the question about uh, uh, whether the, the this decolonization of the university uh, because it was too abstract according to some, and whether it should be uh, theorized first or uh, 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 like practically. Uh, change the you know how the, the the university is organized as an institution yeah so yeah so but then my question is like if we if we do the theorizing first who's going to do the theorizing because as most universities in europe are still uh very uh eurocentered and um and uh, uh not as diverse as you would like, because, for example, well, at my university, uh, University of Amsterdam, I am the only black person there, and which means if uh, if they uh, are going to theorize about how how uh, the university should be decolonized, how can they do it themselves if if the whole reason why there is a problem of colon colonialism of coloniality is because it had been all decided in Euro Europe amongst Europeans without having the input of uh, of Africans there. For example, uh, Kant who could talk about um, other cultures from his little Konigsberg um, and never having left Konigsberg uh, ever in his life, uh, talk say what he said about Africans. So. Um, and then, and the crit criticism of uh, Afri African um, uh, writers, philosophers, um, has been that they were never taken into account when uh, when any theorizing went, was done about the human, you know, like uh, uh, this human uh, humanist uh, project, European human humanist project. In which many colonized uh, uh, sub uh, colonized peoples were excluded from, because whenever we talk, whenever you see human in a lot of these so-called humanist uh, uh, in the work of the, in the works of these humanist philosophers such such as Kant, you can just replace human by European because they're they're very explicitly in as you can see in their other works that they do not consider Africans to be human um, so the whole problem stemmed from there that it was always Europeans talking amongst themselves about what it meant to be human about um, uh, having uh, creating all kinds of theories of not only what the human is but also about the nature of the world and if they continue to do that, if they just uh, theorize now amongst themselves how they can decolonize, how can they s solve a problem that they created? So how can you guarantee the fact that, oh, they're going to take into account other ways uh, um, of other ways of being, ideas of being, um, as well as uh, an African would or can they even do it as as an African would? Because what I uh, also then encounter, what I think is a bit problematic, is to see um, uh, 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 white academics write about how should Africans de decolonize, but how can you as a European decide how an African should decolonize? You were the co you you were the reason why they were colonized, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, more, also more interesting, I think also very important within the context is that often when we read literature about uh, decolonization, it's often, you know, uh, reflecting on the experience of the US. In this case, at least the readings were uh, a lot more uh, balanced, if that's the word to use, because there was a text by Sara Ahmed, you know, based in the UK, and another by Akshil Bembe and Yang. Yeah, but then there's often, yeah, there's often less, you know, self-awareness within the European context, within Belgium, within the Netherlands, of how they are, you know, 
situated within the racial and colonial you know project and its yeah. afterlife and a lot of people do not think that it's necessary for european institutions and european white subjects to actually you know engage with their own colonial and racial history so uh, i mean we are already running out of time because we have a minute before it's three o'clock but maybe quickly and to conclude can you uh, answer this question specifically within the context of uh, Europe and uh, and also maybe even more specific because we talked a lot a bit about France but within the Belgian and the Dutch context and so the problem here is of course in the, in, indeed uh, in for example in the Netherlands is that when they talk about uh, racism about colonialism they always refer to either the US or South Africa and without realizing that the Netherlands not only has its own colonial history, but also its colonial present. Because just like the French, the, the, the Netherlands also still has uh, uh, islands in the Caribbean uh, that are colonized. And many of uh, those this, uh, peoples, uh, a large portion of these people from uh, the Dutch Caribbean are living in the Netherlands. So uh, there are actually, uh, or from former colonies in the Netherlands, because there are actually more, for example, uh, there are more Surinamese people in the Netherlands than in Suriname. Suriname only has a population of about 600,000. And more of these, uh, so there are more uh, of them uh, living in, in the Netherlands. Uh, but they don't have, uh, but you rarely found, find them in, these uh, in, 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 in academic institutions and uh, uh, the universities themselves never really reflect on the situation in the Caribbean islands or in Suriname whenever they talk about colonialism or blackness, uh, about anti-blackness, uh, racism or colonialism, it's always about what happens with black people somewhere else and not what happens in Suriname. So, uh, and you, and this is also why you see that this whole the whole debate about uh, Zwarte Piet is so uh, so is happening so slowly and with much difficulty because this reflection about uh, its own uh, colonial past and how uh, it's uh, it all uh, ties into what is what is currently happening has not been done so. Uh, uh, within our university, uh, uh, at, at the philosophy department, that uh, we uh, this year we we started a, a work group about changes that need to happen within with the philosophy philosophy department, and one of its uh, the stipulations and the recommendations we made was to reflect more on the Dutch, the specifically the Dutch colonial history and Dutch colonial context, and also to bring people from these uh, uh, pla more places, uh, more people from these places in, and not just oh oh let's do diversity, so let's uh, so let's get black people from the U.S. or let's get black people from South Africa. Uh, now South Africa also has history with the, uh, with the Netherlands. But not just oh let's look at let's bring in uh, Black Americans, but more specifically let's look at uh, let's delve into Indonesia more. Let's look uh, delve into Suriname and uh, the islands. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, maybe to to yeah to just bring everything uh, together and um, close the session. Uh, during your lecture, you 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 talked of Immanuel Kant and Hegel's racism. And for philosophers who are present in this in this lecture, I think it would be interesting for you to know that uh, in Jena, where actually Hegel studied, a, a century before there was a black man from Guinea. His name was Anton Bilam Amo. He was a professor of philosophy, medicine, history, law, uh, Greek language, Hebrew, and Latin. Uh, whom uh, was a senior contemporary of Immanuel Kant and whose history and contribution to Western philosophy and African philosophy has been completely displaced and dismissed. And this is a history that, you know, we have inherited and there are a lot of people around us whom, you know, because of whiteness, we continuously displace and make invisible and disorient and I think uh, with uh, Grace uh, Grass's uh, uh, lecture, 
it's 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 an invitation to reflect on our experience and to find ways in which we can you know uh, uh, transform uh, our institutions and our ways of orienting ourselves in the world with others so grace thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and thought provoking uh, lecture and conversation and to all the participants uh, yeah we are very grateful that you you, you you've uh, 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 come and you know become part of this space and i think i will leave the floor to uh, martha to maybe say something if there's anything that needs to be said from me thank you very much <laughs>